is what it takes to become a Special Forces Green Beret. This is as close to real as it gets. Army Special Forces students must pass this final test to graduate and become part of an A-team. This is simulated unconventional warfare in the Pinelands of North Carolina. Don't move! It's called Robin Sage. As an embedded reporter, I cover the Special Forces student A team missions just as I do the real thing downrange. Even following them with my video camera through bushes in a firefight. That's friendly. Hey, that's friendly fire to the right. I was following Army Captain Jared. That's him hours earlier, overseeing his guerrilla or indigenous forces in dark blue. They're giving the pre mission brief at a secret base they helped build. Team three, your task is to clear the building, one and two, and the purpose is to secure the objective. And team four, your task is to secure the hostages, and the purpose is to liberate the prisoners. Captain Jared and his fellow Special Forces students in Army fatigues must work by, with, and through guerrilla forces called G's, just as they will downrange. Here, the G's are ROTC cadets. Well, my focus is really based on the success of the team and building the team and realizing throughout these time here in Pineland that my success is pivotal, pivoted on their success. It helps us impart knowledge that we're supposed to be professionals as well as teach others. The Special Forces students must also build rapport with their guerrilla leaders or warlords called G-Chiefs. Here, the G-Chiefs, like Colonel Goose, are former Green Berets testing them. Make sure you know that that other building is clear before you start shooting or take well-aimed shots because you're going to be shooting right back towards your brothers, okay? So make sure of that. Secondly, Team 1, where you at? Yes, sir. You're talking about where's your uh, limit of fire on the right side? On the right side? Yeah. The, Give me your limits of fire. The limit of fire was going to be the front of the door on the second building, but okay. it should be the left side of Thank the you. Thank you. Everybody understand that, right? Make sure you reinforce that because we don't want to get confused on the target. Their target tonight, capturing an insurgent called Hicks, as G Chief Lieutenant Colonel Stone reminds them. High value target. Who is he? Colonel Hicks. Why did anybody say anything about him? What happens if Hicks escapes? Yeah, do we end up fighting a counterinsurgency maybe in a couple of months or a couple of weeks? Okay. Who's going to go after Hicks? Who's identifying him? Right here. Okay. Fingerprints, face, everything, right? Yes, sir. Because when they come here already, they're advanced tactical and technical proficiency. But what they don't know how to do is teach a bunch of people who have a different culture, maybe a different language, certainly different customs, why they have to do things like that. And to get folks to go along with American um, policy, uh, national policy, and, uh, and make it a win-win situation for both sides. It's called Unconventional Warfare, or UW, which is a core Special Forces mission, as 28-year-old Captain Jared tells me. The UW environment is a very challenging environment in dealing with uh, a host nation and having to, them providing security for you, and you're really dependent upon them for your livelihood and your safety as well, and building that rapport between the team leader and the team and the actual host nation itself is pivotal to your provide to your security uh, while being there. So it's giving you that environment where you're kind of alone and unafraid out there in the middle of nowhere and give you that experience. Robin Sage has been called a laboratory. As far as that, you know, you guys are out in the woods and you can kind of try things out. It's not so much trying new things, but honing the get the skills that they have already and. Uh, figuring out where they fit in the big piece of the pie. The puzzle pieces fit. As they all fit together now in terms of all aspects of whether it's planning or actual execution in the field, um, as well as learning from each other. Which is why they cross-train on each other's specialties, such as communications. I got resistance on the catheter, so. And Green Beret field medicine. The valves are what pump your blood back up to your heart. And sometimes they're real hard to get through valves and you don't want to actually force it. Sorry. Yes, those are real needles and IVs. They lost enough blood, but the blood loss has been stopped and they need fluids in their body to make up for that blood loss. You're, you're just the human pincushion. You didn't like uh, suffer from heat exhaustion and uh, 
all that. <laughs> yeah, I was feeling great right up until uh, I got pulled to do this. <laughs> Cross training and learning how to advise guerrilla forces is critical for small 12 man special forces A teams on their own in remote, hostile locations, as G Chief Lieutenant Colonel Stone explains. And this is big. This is a global, unconventional war. It's going to go on and on forever, no matter who's president, until something breaks out there. And, uh, you know, this is for real. And we want them to learn what they need to know to come back. So when you're being tough and giving them the challenges and, you know, making their life difficult out here, it's because... Conditioned response. We look over at them, they make a mistake, and we make an immediate consequence. So they leave nothing to chance for tonight's mission. Go, go. RPG, RPG. Rehearsing their battle action over and over with the G's they're advising. As an embedded reporter, I go through their tactical drill too, so I know where I need to be to not get in their way. Chuck, you take your team. So we can both do our jobs. Focus tonight is in the little team that I'm controlling, um, always checking them and always teaching them and trying to motivate them and show them as a leader, since most of them are cadets, how you can be a leader and you don't necessarily need to be a overbearing, yelling and screaming leader. Uh, showing them at least a different leadership style. Why do you do this, personally? I can make sure I know who's going back into the fighting force along with the guys that I served with. You know, because it's very important to have competent individuals on the fighting field opposed to guys to just get numbers. So if we can train these guys up enough that we know they go to Iraq or Afghanistan or other countries in the world, and if we know that one guy comes back and goes, you know what, your training saved my life or the lives of others, we're tickled pink. We met our objective and, and we're making a difference. So that's why I do it. Then it's time. We start making contact. You know, we got to continue blowing by, and you guys got to pick up the contact. We load up civilian trucks and horse trailers to hide our infiltration. Fast driving, stopping, backtracking, my video camera rolling, zigzagging the bumpy country back roads. A wrong turn becomes a teaching moment. You've got to verify the information. We got our timeline back on schedule, right? <laughs> you know? can't fucking do this. Let's see you're looking forward. All right, get everybody back on track. Smooshed in the back of the truck with the men, I learn the team did not do reconnaissance and were working off an old map. So, let's go, let's go, let's go. They're not likely to make this mistake again downrange. You see it dismounted out front. Dismounted out front of the tower. I see one, two, at least three. Game on. EPW means enemy prisoner of war. The special forces students secure a female hostage. We got two back there. Find Hicks. Find Hicks. Bring the other prisoner out here. Check the bodies. Find Hicks. This Hicks. Turn him over. Turn this fat ass. Get the fuck over. What you're hearing off camera is the sound of a simulated execution. Don't get in the fucking way of hatred. Stay fucking dead. The high value target, Colonel Hicks, has just been assassinated by one of the G Chiefs. They were supposed to capture him, not kill him. You go over there to the pup point. We got Hicks. Let's go. As the Special Forces Student A-Team and their G's exfiltrate, I interview tonight's opposition force volunteers. Uh, we are the enemy. The enemy? Yes. So is it the idea to make them, uh, you know, for it. why do you do it? Uh, to help out the military. Yeah, yeah. Everything we can. In military background? 
I don't know. No, you just do it just for the heck of it? I do. I'm a desk pusher, pencil pusher. Desk driver. The better we do, the more prepared they're going to be out in the real world. So that's what, you, what they learn can save their life, save a teammate's life, and they can help free the oppressed. The oppressed only bear, yeah. yeah. We, we consider it a patriotic duty. As I switch to night scope. There's a dead guy up here. I'm going to hop on up top, guys. So, okay. So I climb the tower, shoot video, and interview Lieutenant Colonel Stone as a Special Forces assessor. Coming up. While the A-teams wait for their helicopters in the field in front of us. How have they done so far and as, as we are standing here waiting for a helicopter for Exfil? It was fast. They did what they were supposed to do in taking down the target and getting to the hostages, the high-value target of Colonel Hicks, uh, and eliminating the obstacles, including the ADA and this tower, within the first few seconds of combat. That was absolutely essential to the success of the mission. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mistakes have been made, but for the most part, this was a great victory. Uh, me, as a member of the press, noticed that uh, the high-value target was uh, uh, taken out of commission. Is that a good way of putting it? And it was eliminated. But did you notice how the Americans tried to save him? They um, they used deception on us uh, as the guerrilla force. They knew how much we hated them. They knew something was going to happen. Uh, and what they did was they didn't say a word up until they found Hicks and they spirited him away. Uh, and if we didn't have our uh, assessor network there, he, they would have actually captured him alive and taken him to trial. So that having, having your commendable. spies out and about is a... Well, <laughs> I mean, we, we wanted to stress the situation and, uh, and when we did it, uh, when we found Hicks, um, the Americans knew better than to try and, and stop us from that. They almost got him out of here alive, and it would have if we didn't kind of change the uh, thing a little Add bit. a little adversity. Yeah, we, yeah. We, we added more adversity than it probably would normally have taken. But I was really impressed. They almost got away with it. They were good. Even though you all try to put mm -hmm. some flies in the ointment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, the hostages were all rescued. That's a good thing. Captain Jared and his fellow Special Forces students on the helicopters graduated and became Green Berets, then immediately deployed. Captain Jared even skipped his graduation ceremony to get to his A-team and do all this for real. And off they go into the night. With Army Special Forces, Alex Quaid in the Pinelands of North Carolina.